Good morning. I ran away with the circus, chapter six. Um, these are pictures of me when I was 16, and uh, the little guy on my le on the left is the reason uh, <laughs> is the climax of this uh, story here. So last we heard um, on day seven of the lockdown here. Um, Kevin and I were heading on a bus to Florida, thanks to pistols. And uh, we get in Florida, we land in Florida with like 56 bucks in our pocket, one extra change of clothes, and the clothes on our back. I had no ID. My wallet was back <laughs> in the evidence room. And... Uh, we get off the bus and we're like, what the hell now? Throw our coats out and we start hitchhiking. What are we going to do just to get out of the airport? It's like miles from anywhere in Miami because that's where we took the bus to because that's basically the only place I'd ever heard of in Florida, um, mostly. So uh, we stick our thumbs out. And we get picked up by a hippie in a white pickup truck who had long hair, guinea tea, and cut off shorts and sandals. I was like, yeah, this is my kind of uniform. And uh, so this guy's really cool. Hippie picks us up, hitchhiking. He's like, where are you guys going? We're like, you know what? We don't friggin' know. We tell him we just got here from New York. What do we do? He says, well, you really should go down to Fort Lauderdale because that's where all the young kids go, uh, you know, to the streets there. So uh, he's like, hey, I'm going to a party. You guys want to come? And he's passing us a lit dube. I'm like, yeah, man, party, let's go. So this is a, this is a show. This whole first couple of hours is a show. He takes us to a random party in Miami, and he tells us Miami's for old people and a nationality. He says, uh, go to Fort Lauderdale. So uh, we go to this party, and it's like the party and mama told me not to come. People, young college hippies all over the place, dubs, beers, liquor i guess and music and didn't know whose house it was there was a thousand people there so we just walk in with the hippie dude and we grab a beer and me and kevin are like look at us bro <laughs> we're not here an hour and we're partying wouldn't you know it loud noise in the street knock on the door the cops are raiding the place People are running out the back door, us included. Didn't know where the hell we were going. We were just running. You know, that we knew how to do. So we run out the back door with the other hippies. You know, I wish I had this on film. And everybody just scatters. The cops were breaking up the party. And uh, so we're on foot again. At least we know where to go now. We lost the hippie guy. So we go back out to the high when we hitch to Fort Lauderdale. And I forget, you know, the rides we got or how we got there. But eventually we got to Fort Lauderdale. And the guy was right. Uh, there was a, it was called the Strip A1A in Fort Lauderdale, right along the beach. The beach on one side and a row of bars and hotels and a Burger King and a game room on the other side of the road. Uh, at the inner, uh, at where A1A hit Los Olas Boulevard. And uh, that's where we ended up because I had the most kids. The, the, the game room was packed. There was foosball tables. Kevin and I were, <laughs> were foosball experts practically. We played at the Selden Center Reach Youth Center, which is behind Eddie D's. I don't know what's there now across from Houston Chevrolet, that little shopping center by State Farm, behind State Farm. And we played foosball for free for years. And uh, then we, you know, once uh, once we got to Florida to the game room, 
for a quarter out of our $56 in our pockets, we could hold the foosball table for hours because the winner stays on the table and kids would keep coming up and putting their quarters up. And we would just, I had a left-hand goalie shot like an animal, if I must say so myself. I leaned into it. I growled. I lifted the whole table. Some guys played that the, the, left, the goalies couldn't shoot to score. I usually made that known first ball. If it came to my goalie, I buried it. And next shot, if I got it again, I would bury it. Then they would, then if I, and I, I had a pull shot. Kevin had a pull shot like lightning. And uh, so we, that's what we did. We held the table and we started having one meal a day. We split a hamburger at Burger King. I lost 20 pounds the month I was down in Florida uh, on the streets. And we had, uh, that's when I got into condiments, anything that was free, mayo, relish, ketchup, mustard, onions, pickles, lettuce, don't upset us. And uh, we split a burger once a day because we had no fucking money. So we're playing foosball and uh, that was that. The first, then night falls and the place is going to close and we're walking the streets and we walk down by the street a bit and we see some, I, I spy a spot behind some bushes in the parking lot of a hotel. So we lay down and slept under the bushes under the stars uh, the first night in Florida. We wake up in the morning because it was raining and we're all wet, forgot about rain outside. And as we start to walk, I notice something on the back of Kevin's neck. Kevin had long hair, but I see something on his neck. I says, hold on, bro. I move his hair. It's a giant white blood sucking leech or something latched onto him. I flick it away. And he shudders. He's like, what was it? I says, a little something. He had no idea how gnarly this thing looked. So we walk around, uh, end up back at the game room, holding the foosball table for hours for a quarter out of our, you know, 55, 75 now. And uh, we meet a couple of guys called Al and Dave, who are like college guys. I think they're from Ohio or something. Everybody in this game room, nobody was from Florida. Uh, everybody was from out of state. And uh, Al and Dave gave us a little run on the foosball. So uh, that went back and forth for, for a while. And uh, so we're, we're joking with these guys. And it turns out that, you know, they just got here kind of recently, too. And they were lucky to get an apartment from some old perverted guy. And uh, we could have played them for, could we come move in with you and beat them? I don't know. That'd be exciting. But anyway, and uh, the guys tell us, uh, yeah, you can get a job at any hotel that they're renovating around here. We're working at one, two doors down. You know, if you want to come down tomorrow, you know, I'll talk to the boss for you. So like, thanks, Al. Thanks, Dave. So uh, that second night, I think we... Um, Oh no, the second night we uh we we uh didn't want to get wet again, so uh I decided to go under uh a bridge where the bridge meets the land cuz there's you know, you can't get wet under there. There's cover. So it's pitch black. It's like midnight after the uh game room next to Burger King closes and we go uh Grab a piece of cardboard out of some dumpster somewhere to sleep on each. And we walk over to where the uh, Las Olas Boulevard goes over some canal or something. There's canals all over the place. And there's, you know, dry land under that bridge where it meets the land. So, and there's a row of bushes like along the edge of the under the bridge. So we go between the bushes, pitch black, silent. You know, we're trying to be quiet. We didn't want, you know, anybody to know we were even there. And uh, we silently go a few feet under the overhang between the bushes, lay our cardboard down, and 
lay our heads down and we actually went to sleep, I guess, who knows, a little bit. Anyway, we wake up to flashlight light in our face and the sound of a running car. It's the cops. Jesus Christ. All right, you guys out here, let's see some ID. And then he says, yeah, everybody. And we're like, everybody. He shone in the light behind us. There was 50 people sleeping under that bridge that we had no idea they were even there. We could have had our throats slashed in the night. Didn't know these people were there. Everybody had the same idea. Everybody was silent. So I was like, what the hell? They line us all up. Uh, I didn't have ID. I was sweating that. Uh, and that I've learned very quickly what works best is yes, officer, no officer. Yes, officer, no officer. Yes, officer, no officer. A couple of guys in the line mouthed off, mouthed off and they went right in the car. They got to me. I was like, no, I've lost my wallet. Yes, sir. No, sir. How do you do, sir? Thank you, sir. Uh, so me and Kevin got out of there. So, uh, that ruined that night. So we just stayed up and the next day, another quarter down to 55, 50. And we, uh, played foosball all day. You know, Al and Dave came down and, uh, so we go down, I go down to the hotel that Al is working at and the guy hires me immediately. Some big bald guy. He was a contractor. Uh, I forget his name and, uh, looked like Kojak and, uh, he hires me and what they were doing was renovating the hotel. And we were Al and I, who thought he was physical. He was a little shorter than me, a little lighter than me, a little wiry, but you know, I'd bury him in anything. Uh, so Al and I are having like a, who can run the garbage pail that the contractors fill up with rubble out to the dumpster and back faster. And we did this all day cause he wasn't going to beat me and he, he wasn't going to let me beat him. So as soon as these contractors filled the garbage can, it was like every 30 seconds, we were running out to the dumpster and running it back all day. And this impressed another contractor. Now, I guess we weren't working for the ball guy. Yes. Yet this impre impressed the ball guy who witnessed this. And he calls us over. He says, Hey, you guys want to, you guys want a better job? We're like, yeah, sure. He's like, all right, meet me uh, at this address tomorrow morning. We're like, yeah. So uh, we finished the day, and then uh, Al and Dave were nice enough to let us come share their room. They had a one big bedroom apartment, and uh, so that Al and I could be on the same page and get you know this better job the next day. So uh, we uh, go to their apartment walk to their apartment a couple of miles away, uh, down Las Olas Boulevard and they squeeze us in, which was really nice of them. And, uh, the next day, Al and I walk down to this address in a weird neighborhood, you know, look a little affluent. Yeah. in uh, Fort Lauderdale and we're walking over little bridges that go over the canals that now are running behind these rich people's houses. And I see something white and curved like a whale back his back crest and go under the bridge. It was a manatee going under the bridge, the little hand bridge that we're walking across. It was amazing. Just out there in the wild for free manatee swimming by. So we get to this, uh, house and the contractors are there. We were early, so we weren't late. And, uh, it was for the guy that owns the bluebird bus company. I used to see the bluebird on the side of the buses all the time. Uh, bluebird bus company. They were building a second floor and we were the laborers for this ball guys carpentry team. And, uh, I had to work under the name Kevin cause I had to get a paycheck now and I didn't have any ID. So I brought Kevin's ID licenses. Didn't have pictures in the stone age. So, uh, time out. Talk amongst yourselves.
So it was funny because the guy who used to be talking to me uh, or wanted to tell me something, and he would say, Kevin, 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 and I'd be staring right at him thinking, why is he saying Kevin? How does he know Kevin? <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit, yeah, I'm Kevin. He thought I was challenged. I'm like, what? Um, but, you know, Al and I were, you know, still competing and, you know, running lumber up to these guys, and they were very impressed, and everybody was happy and hunky-dory. I was swiping peanut butter out of the pantry uh, to sneak home because we were starving on our one burger a day. And uh, one night... We stayed, I forgot to tell you, on the third night, we stayed in a guy, Bobby, I think his name was also from somewhere else, out of state. We spent the night in his car, and uh, the song Give Me Three Steps had just came out. And we listened to Give Me Three Steps over and over and over and spent the night in his car. Um, then the fourth night is when we got with Al and Dave. I got notes here on my Florida stuff. Um, let me make sure I don't forget anything. Oh, Al was, had a bit part in the movie, The Graduate. We had to, and, and lo and behold, it happened to be on one night in the month that I was there. And we, we watched the two hour freaking The Graduate piece of crap movie to see two seconds of the side of Al's head in the library. It was hysterical. He was, he was so uh, full of himself, he used to actually imagine cars beeping or slowing down were girls checking him out. So walking to work, he was constantly stopping and posturing <laughs> when cars went by. It was hysterical, the people that you meet. <clears throat> uh, Dave had a job doing something somewhere. Kevin uh, couldn't seem to get a job. He had some meat cutting or wrapping experience and he went around and applied everywhere but once they catch your accent they would call you a snowbird and i learned what a snowbird is they think you're just down there because it's getting cold up north it must have been october or november i don't really know uh and they would assume he was a snowbird and he was just going to come down for a few months and then take off so he was having a trouble getting uh finding a job i got lucky with al and we had a paycheck like you know the, the, the first or second week and I had to walk to the boss who gave me the checks bank because I didn't have a bank account. I couldn't open a bank account. I didn't have any ID. It was in my dad's car in New York. So uh, I had to walk to the bank that the guy, the check was made out from. And uh, they gave me the business. I said, listen, I don't have an account. The check was written from this bank. Give me the fucking money. So, and under Kevin's license. So they uh, cashed the check. And then maybe we had two hamburgers that night. And uh, this big ball guy, uh, he had his paintings, uh, you know, a million windows one day at an apartment complex. And boy, he picked up that brush and it, it, it looked like the paint just flowed on. And I copied him and got pretty damn good at that too. Um, but... Kevin on the street, uh, learning the, the bus transfers and how to get around on that and, you know, where the uh, all-you-can-eat buffet was. We walked to one for like three miles. It wasn't worth it because by the time we ate and walked back, we were hungry again. Um, but it was all you could eat for two bucks. Uh, Kevin also came across a stolen phone credit card number that all the kids were passing around, those bastards. Um so after uh, th three or four weeks and uh, of this, I took the uh, credit card and went to a payphone. And sure enough, you just how I couldn't even remember how to do it, but you put it, punch in the credit card number, and I called uh, my girlfriend or ex-girlfriend at the time, Jenny, in uh, in uh, Setauket. And she answered the phone. You know, nobody's heard from me for a month. I just disappeared. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. Uh, I never heard from pistols. Uh, I never heard from anybody. I didn't know what was going on. So, uh, I mean, it was just radio silence for a solid month. And 
uh, Jenny answers the phone. She says, hello. I says, hi, Jenny. It's Bobby. She's like, it's like she saw a ghost. She's like, oh, my God. She's like, you better call your mother. I guess Jenny had gotten, you know, the first thousand phone calls. Where is he? You better call your mother. I says, all right. So I hang up the phone with Jenny. I call my mother. Mom, it's Bob. Oh, my God. Oh, thank God. Oh, where are you? Oh, what are you doing? Oh, what's going on? Uh, I says, I'm okay. I says, uh, I'm with Kevin. I says, uh, and she said the one thing that changed my plan on a heartbeat. She says, your little brother, Peter, the guy on the, your little bottom left there, your little brother, Peter, cries himself to sleep every night. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> what? Why? Where did that come from? But I says, oh, I got to go. Uh, F the cops. I got to go. You know, because I figured there was, you know, warrants out and they were waiting on the corner the whole month for me. And uh, mom said, no, the cops came and dropped off your dad's car and that was the end of it. No mention of, you know, the loot that was allegedly in there. Um, so I says, well, can you wire me money so I can come home? And I couldn't even do that today, but somehow she wired money to the Western Union and I got to the Western Union and got the money and can't imagine how we got to the airport um, in Fort Lauderdale. I don't even remember, but we obviously did. Got the money at, at Western Union, got plane tickets, and we flew back to New York. I was 20 pounds lighter, <laughs> 20 years wiser, um, and I was still 17. And, uh, damn it, and uh, got to JFK, and I says, oh, boy, here it comes. Dad's going to be pissed. Dad wasn't that pissed. We had the long talk, you know, or whatever, but, you know, which is sometimes I'd rather get a beating than the long talk, but we had the long talk, and, you know, Mom and Dad came and got me at JFK. And uh, I went home a changed man, and uh, uh, Newfield said, uh, don't bother coming back. And uh, I guess it soon became Christmas time, and the petting zoo and Mr. Mark Ruggles returned to Smith Haven Mall. And uh, boom, I had a job immediately. And then I wasn't in school, so I worked every day, and I was, you know, pulling down 200 a week. And uh, we'll continue in Chapter 7, y'all. Peace. Stay safe. Love you, Jeff.